Thank you very much. My name is Lisa Diller. I'm a pediatric oncologist, and I'll be presenting today with Jennifer Ye and Richard Parad, my colleagues at Harvard Medical School. We're going to be reporting on our work developing a DNA-based newborn screening test for early detection of pediatric cancer predisposition syndromes. The objectives of this talk are to describe the rationale for genetic testing in newborns for cancer predisposition syndromes, and I'll be talking about that. Then my colleague, Dr. Ye, will share her results of a modeling study which we've done, which analyzes the benefits and costs of applying this testing in newborn screening population-wide. And then Dr. Parad will describe the design and preliminary data from a newly developed uh, targeted next-generation sequencing panel for use on dried blood samples. About 15,000 children are diagnosed with cancer each year in the United States. And over the past five or so years, we've learned that at least six to 10% of new pediatric cancer patients have an identifiable cancer predisposition syndrome due to the presence of a disease causing genetic variant. This work has been performed using germline DNA samples from large cohorts of childhood cancer patients with a variety of cancers. So taking that math, each year, about 900 children in the United States develop cancer in the setting of a cancer predisposition syndrome. In this uh, figure here, you can see a, uh, a summary of uh, many of the tumors that we see in pediatrics, as well as the proportion of patients who have been found to have a gene variant. The point of showing this to you is twofold. One, to show you that there are a wide number of genes that we are talking about when we talk about cancer predisposition in children. And secondly, because what we're seeing are some very, very rare tumors like field chromocytoma and paraganglioma, very rare in children, but with a very high proportion of disease-causing variants in the germ line, and then some common tumors like Wilms tumor, where a smaller proportion have an underlying uh, gene variant causing that or associated with the development of that tumor. However, the uh, absolute impact of that 10% uh, or so is, uh, is because of the frequency of Wilms tumor is important to note. In my practice as a pediatric oncologist, uh, genetic risk has become a very important element of our work. There are increasing numbers of patients that we see to, who see a genetic counselor because of cancer risk. Almost every patient who has a solid tumor or a brain tumor in our practice is seen by a genetic counselor and offered genetic testing. We have a large number of individuals who are being followed because of positive germline testing or a germline test that suggests a cancer predisposition syndrome, and this number has been growing over time. We use mostly panel testing, uh, commercially available panel testing. Here is an example, the Invite panel test, depending upon the patient's history. But this is not only being applied to children with cancer, it's being applied to children with cancer predisposition phenotypes, children with a cancer predisposition, predisposition syndrome detected on other genetic testing, such as whole exome sequencing, done for some other concern like autism, for example, or cascade testing based upon family member results. What do we do with this information? For most pediatric cancer syndromes, we actually now have consensus guidelines for tumor surveillance. The evidence that this surveillance is effective varies from syndrome to syndrome, but we do have expert panel and literature to support the kinds of surveillance that we currently do. So what about population testing for childhood cancer risk? Or can we use genetics to find children at risk for cancer? And if so, which genes for which cancers? And if so, what's the impact on health? I've spent a fair bit of my career taking care of children with uh, RB1 variants or retinoblastoma predisposition. And I thought I'd start with that case as a uh, prime case for the development of population-based uh, genetic testing for cancer risk. Retinoblastoma, as you may know, is the most common ocular tumor in pediatrics, and it occurs in somewhere between one in 14,000 and 18,000 children. It's a tumor almost exclusively of infants and toddlers, and there are two distinct clinical patterns. One is the heritable or bilateral disease pattern, which presents at very young age, usually in early infancy. Both eyes are usually involved, 
There, are often, there is often more than one tumor in a single retina. There's a family history in some cases of retinoblastoma. Most cases have an identifiable germline variant in the RB1 gene, and this accounts for about 40% overall of retinoblastoma cases. On the other hand, there are patients with unilateral disease, mostly toddlers and young children, although it can occur in the first year of life. Usually only one eye is involved, and about 10 to 15% of these unilateral cases are considered heritable in that an identifiable germline variant is found in the RB1 gene. I'd like to tell you about a uh, case, a family that I take care of because a picture is worth a thousand words. The little boy on the right, the one in the cap, is a child who had retinoblastoma bilaterally diagnosed at about two years of age with no known family history. He was found to have tumors in both eyes that were quite advanced. He ended up getting chemotherapy, radiation, removal of one eye, and is blind. He was tested for an RV1 variant, was found to have a pathogenic variant in the germline in RV1. And when his sister was born, she underwent not only exam under anesthesia to look for eye tumors, but also RB1 testing. She was found to also carry the variant and has had all her tumors picked up on surveillance, treated with cryotherapy or laser therapy, and has perfect vision. Early surveillance based upon family history results in preservation of vision, avoidance of the use of radiation, avoidance of the use of chemotherapy, fewer enucleations or removal of eyes, and better survival, as shown in this slide. Because patients who carry germline variants in the retinoblastoma gene and the RB1 gene are highly um, predisposed to developing cancers, other cancers in adulthood, particularly in the previously irradiated field, and those cancers are very difficult to treat, the mortality in the setting of radiotherapy during adulthood 20, 30, and 40 years after cancer is quite high. Avoidance of radiation therapy is now a standard of care, but in some cases we need it for life-saving treatment of children. So I feel hereditary retinoblastoma probably does meet criteria for newborn screening. It's an important condition. Acceptable treatment are available. Facilities exist for diagnosis and treatment. It's difficult to recognize early, and we have suitable screening tests. But what about other genes and cancer predisposition syndromes? Uh, in this study that I mentioned earlier, uh, done at St. Jude's Children's Hospital, a group of about 1,100 children who had a cancer diagnosis were studied for the presence of an aut autosomal dominant cancer predisposition syndrome genetically. And the largest group of mutations found were patients who had uh, TP53 mutations as the most frequently identified cause of autosomal dominant cancer syndromes in children. The name for the syndrome uh, is Lee Frameni syndrome. I'm sure many of you are aware of this syndrome. Is this a candidate for a newborn screening? Lee Frameni syndrome has a very high risk of developing tumors. On the left, you can see the absolute risk of developing a tumor by uh, 10 years of age is about 14%, and the excess risk is over 100 fold. Surveillance in uh, individuals with Lee Frameni syndrome has been shown to reduce the burden of therapy. Uh, in this case, there are carriers of a recurrent familial TP53 variant in a state in Brazil, which had, was uh, uh, formed uh, from a founder effect. Those children are known to be at risk for cancer, particularly adrenal cortical carcinoma. The state of Brazil started a genetic testing program with, associated with screening and surveillance, as you can see in the table on the right, resulted in smaller tumors, lower stage, and less use of chemotherapy in the patients who receive surveillance versus those who didn't receive surveillance. Similarly, cancer screening in Lee Frameni syndrome um, under current standards in the United States includes laboratory studies, serial abdominal ultrasounds, physical exam, and an annual whole body MRI. This is known as the Toronto Protocol. The Toronto group published their result of a survival benefit for families who choose screening, showing an increase in overall survival in the families that chose surveillance versus those that did not choose surveillance. So what about other genes? Uh, what about a panel test for cancer predisposition in newborns? 
uh, as you'll hear about later in this uh, in this presentation, we created a panel called the PERC-SEQ panel, standing for a pediatric early risk of cancer sequencing panel, which involves 11 genes associated with an increased risk of 12 very early onset cancers. These genes were chosen on the basis of literature review, looking at penetrance, the potential impact of early detection on outcome, the appropriateness for newborn screening, in other words, we chose those genes that are associated with very early onset tumors in the first few years of life. We only fo focused on solid tumor predisposition, um, including brain tumors, but not leukemia predisposition. And we focused on autosomal dominant syndromes. When we thought about what genes to include, we included the RB1 and TP53, as I talked about earlier. We also added the RET gene, for, uh, which has a very high penetrance for the development of early onset medullary thyroid carcinoma. And the three genes in this box are those for which we have the most information about penetrance and have high penetrance during early childhood. The rest of the genes are associated with uh, tumors that we know to be very common in young children. For some of them, the penetrance is completely unknown because of their rarity. For others, the benefit of screening may not be uh, uh, studied carefully, and these remain uh, a question of whether they should be included on a panel. But if we think about this panel, again, we look at the Wilson and Younger criteria, and we see that, in fact, uh, cancer predisposition screening may meet the criteria based upon many of these factors. Newborn genetic screening for pediatric cancer predisposition syndromes has compelling data for, that is available. It accounts for probably about 10% of pediatric cancer patients. There's established surveillance recommendations for cancer predisposition syndromes, and early detection of malignancy may lead to improved outcomes. What we don't know are the benefits, the risks, and the cost effectiveness, and for this, we need more data. I turn to my colleague, Jennifer Yeh, who, with whom I have worked on helping us understand the best care for pediatric patients who have cancer in terms of their long-term follow-up, and asked her if we could use the same collaboration that we had done in the past using her um, expertise in decision science to estimate the benefits, risks, and cost effectiveness of application of a panel test for newborn sequencing, for newborn cancer predisposition syndromes. Thank you, Lisa. Before I present the model and our findings, I thought I would start with some background on cost-effectiveness analysis. Healthcare decision makers are often tasked with deciding which interventions to adopt or commit resources to when trying to improve the health of a population. To do so, they ideally need a method for weighing the benefits, harms, and costs for one option with the benefits, harms, and costs for other options. Cost-effectiveness analysis provides one option for doing just this. Cost-effectiveness analysis, or CEA, is an analytic framework for quantifying the relative benefits and costs among two or more alternative interventions for a disease or public health issue. It is designed to allow decision makers to clearly understand the trade-offs of costs, harms, and benefits between alternative treatments. It combines these considerations into a single metric called the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, or the ICER, that can be used to inform decision making when limited sources are available. CEAs also often use simulation modeling as a way to synthesize data from multiple sources to project long term outcomes. Importantly, a CEA does not make the decision for individuals, clinicians, or policymakers, but rather it provides information that can facilitate decision making. And in that sense, we think of CEA as one of the tools that can guide the decision-making process. Circling back to Lisa's slide on the criteria for newborn screening, I want to highlight again that there are some compelling data to support newborn genetic screening for pediatric cancer predisposition syndromes. As Lisa mentioned, about 10% of pediatric cancer patients have been found to have a germline mutation. There are established surveillance recommendations for cancer predisposition syndromes, and it's thought that early detection of malignancy may lead to improved survival. 
However, where we need more data is on the benefits, risks, and cost effectiveness of such a population-based screening approach. Because of the rarity of childhood cancer, it's unlikely that a randomized control trial would be conducted given the number of newborns and the long time horizon that would be required. We therefore used a simulation modeling approach to conduct a CEA to evaluate newborn genetic screening for pediatric cancer predisposition syndromes. We developed a simulation model to estimate the clinical benefits and cost effectiveness of newborn genetic screening for 11 pediatric cancer predisposition syndromes. We call this model the Precision Medicine Policy and Treatment Model, or the PREEMP model. Data sources that were used to inform this model included ClinVar, NOMAD, the SEER Cancer Registries, published studies, and cost databases. And the gene and panel cancers included are listed here. So what's nice and very powerful in my opinion about simulation modeling is that it provides us with a virtual laboratory to test hypotheses about newborn screening. In the US, there are approximately 3.7 million newborns born each year. So using the model, we can simulate the lifelong outcomes for a cohort representative of the 3.7 million newborns born each year under different scenarios. The first scenario is usual care. So this is what's happening now with no organized or planned testing for pediatric cancer predisposition syndromes. Among the 3.7 million newborns, a subset of these newborns will develop cancer before age 20. Most will not. For those that develop cancer, their variant status is unknown. They face a risk of dying from the cancer as well as early mortality in adulthood. And this is as a result of exposures to chemotherapy and radiation, given that the organs of these children are still developing at time of cancer treatment. We then use the model to simulate the exact same 3.7 million newborns, this time under a different scenario or different strategy, a targeted next generation sequencing approach or TNGS for newborn screening. By genetically testing each newborn, the variant status for the 11 gene panel is revealed for all newborns. Newborns with pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants undergo surveillance, and some of these individuals will go on to develop cancer and will have improved outcomes via early detection of their cancer through surveillance. This includes improved survival as well as decreased risks for late mortality as an adult. And this is because early diagnosis of a cancer often obviates the need for radiation as part of cancer treatment for some cancers, as Lisa mentioned. Then individuals without a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant identified then proceed as they would under usual care. Since we're interested in the cost effectiveness of newborn genetic screening for pediatric cancer predisposition syndromes, let's review some of the cost ingredients that went into our analysis. For the 11 gene panel test, we assumed a cost of $55 per newborn or $5 per gene tested based on expert opinion, cost of a commercially available panel, and the cost of current NBS. Newborns with pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants detected would undergo surveillance, which varies by the variant detected. For example, for TP53, individuals would have a physician visit every year, which would cost about $200 as well as undergo a brain MRI every year, which would cost about $840, along with other recommended evaluations. Cancer treatment costs were based on a Canadian study that evaluated costs by treatment phase. The initial and continuing phase of treatment cost $175,000, while the final phase or last year of life cost $365,000. In our model, we assumed that newborns for which cancer death was avoided would not incur the final phase of costs. And here I show the two strategies side by side. I note to more fully capture uncertainty in our model parameters, we ran the model 1000 times and sampled from distributions for each model parameter to estimate 95% uncertainty intervals for all modeled outcomes. So what did we find? Using the model, we estimated that among a cohort of 3.7 million newborns, approximately 1,800 individuals would develop a cancer predisposition syndrome associated cancer before the age of 20. 
with TNGS, approximately 1,600 individuals with a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant would be identified. And among these variant carriers, an estimated 230 would develop cancer before the age of 20, resulting in an estimated positive predictive probability or penetrance of 15% for the 11 gene panel. Another way to think of this is that for every pathogenic, likely pathogenic variant carrier identified that would go on to develop cancer before age 20, there would be six that would not. In terms of the clinical benefit, compared with usual care, TNGS would reduce cancer deaths before age 20 overall by 8% and avert over 50% of cancer deaths among the pathogenic variant carriers. How about the cost effectiveness? So compared with usual care, TNGS had an incremental cost effectiveness ratio or an ICER of about $245,000 per life year gained. We need some sort of benchmark to help us interpret this number. In the US, it's generally considered that interventions with the ICER less than 100,000 per life year gained are considered good value for resources invested. This tells us that in our analysis, in the base case in which we assumed the cost would be $55 per testing of each newborn. Um, a newborn genetic screening for pediat pediatric cancer predisposition syndromes would not be considered cost effective. However, what's nice about our virtual laboratory is that we can vary model parameters to understand how they impact model results. In particular, we can vary the cost of genetic testing to identify the cost at which newborn screening would be considered cost effective. And when we did so, we found that at a panel cost of $20, the ICER fell below the $100,000 per life year benchmark and would be considered good value. As with any study, our study had several limitations, including assumptions on a stage shift benefit for surveillance. We also assumed full adherence to screening and surveillance guidelines. We also did not include factors that may impact the value of targeted next generation sequencing. This included um, focusing only on cancer risk before age 20. For example, for TP53, we know that the gene is associated with adult onset cancers. We did not include the benefit of avoidance of non-fatal toxicities of cancer therapy. For uh, RB1 and retinoblastoma, this would include blindness. We also did not include a parental distress or anxiety associated with newborn sequencing or test result results or the family effects, such as identifying variant carriers among parents or siblings in our analysis. We also acknowledge that the cost of genetic testing is difficult to estimate in a changing NBS environment. But a strength of our modeling approach is that as new data emerge, our model can be refined to provide updated estimates. In summary, our study found that population-based genetic testing of newborns may reduce mortality associated with pediatric cancers. As genetic testing costs decline, targeted newborn screening for pediatric cancer genes could be potentially cost-effective. And I hope that you'll agree that cost-effectiveness analysis provides a useful framework for understanding how advances in genetics can be applied to populations and what the implications might be for public health, in particular for newborn screening. And here I'll pass it on to you, Richard. Thank you, uh, Jennifer and Lisa, for setting the stage for uh, discussing more details about the actual uh, newborn screening uh, end of this uh, proposal. Newborn screening algorithms vary widely by disorder and mode of analysis, but some typical patterns of screening, as presented in this slide, involve a, a multiple tier uh, approach. For some disorders, a simple single tier, single analyte, such as phenylalanine measured by tandem mass spectroscopy for PKU, may be adequate to identify at-risk babies. More recently, it has become common to use multiple analytes within the newborn screening lab. Often the first tier of the screen is a biochemical analyte, such as immunoreactive trypsinogen for cystic fibrosis, with a second tier added to improve the positive predictive value before reporting. Over the past 30 years, cystic fibrosis algorithms have evolved down several roads. From the start, a second IRT at a later 
time point was the means for identifying newborns to refer to sweat testing as a diagnostic test. With the identification of the CFTR gene responsible for cystic fibrosis, now the same initial sample can go through multiple testing tiers using different testing approaches. Always the IRT is the first tier and an out of range result prompts a second tier DNA based test, either a variant panel or more recently targeted next generation sequencing or a combination of these two approaches in which two tests are performed for the first two tiers and then the third DNA test done before sweat testing is an improvement on the initial IRT IRT algorithm. Um, this minimizes the number of false positives found by the IRT DNA algorithm alone. It is uncommon for newborn screeners to think about DNA as the first or primary sequencing analyte. In fact, there are two disorders currently screened for where DNA is used as the primary analyte, but not uh, using next generation sequencing. SCID is screened for after DNA extraction by counting TREX. And SMA screened for through uh, a number of DNA-based algorithms uh, may be based on looking for a single base pair variant using uh, PCR methods. Uh, a group I have worked with recently published a paper on a disorder not currently screened for called Menke's disease, for which the FDA has recently approved uh, therapy, which must, must be started very early in order to improve outcome. This disorder cannot be screened by any current newborn screening modalities, and we propose to utilize targeted next generation sequencing of the ATP7A gene as a first tier screen. To carry this one step further, cancer predisposition syndromes, which can be accounted for by multiple genes, could be screened for with a primary DNA tier using a panel of genes and targeted next generation sequencing. So back to this slide again, uh, thinking about uh, Wilson and Jungner, I will focus on uh, now on trying to defend the suitability of primary DNA next generation sequencing as a screening test. In the panel that's already been described to you, retinoblastoma caused by variants in the RB1 gene is the most clear cut candidate. We do not screen for this disorder with the red reflex exam sorry, we currently do screen for this disorder with the red reflex exam, but that test has not been shown to have very good sensitivity, and thus a better test is being proposed here. I'm sure that proposing primary sequencing as a screening test may invoke some anxiety in some newborn screeners. Here are some problems that might be anticipated. Access to technology one would need to have sequencing equipment, very expensive equipment, and expertise in sequencing uh, in the public health newborn screening laboratory. Cost, isn't next generation sequencing extremely expensive? Yes, but uh, there may be ways to overcome this with creative alternatives. Uh, diagnostic accuracy, is this modality accurate enough to identify both single base pair and larger insertion or deletions or other structural variants? Interpretation. This could be very labor intensive. However, there are rapidly developing means for utilizing artificial intelligence and machine learning to automate and shrink down the number of variants that uh, need attention uh, in a sequencing file to minimize the amount of time, human time needed to make a, a, a reading. Detection of variants of unknown significance. This is a big one. And even if there is a variant provided for interpretation, how do we know that causes disease? And you've already heard Lisa talk about known variants that cause disease but have variable penetrance. And what would be the protocol for interpret interpreting these findings. 
They're rapidly improving guidelines for reporting variants of concern, such as, such as pathogenic and likely pathogenic categories proposed by ACMG. If one does detect a variant that's not a pathogenic variant, what do we do with that information? Is it presented to the family? Is genetic counseling needed for all information detected? Many questions are raised in proposing to use primary next generation screening, but all of these are potentially conquerable and are under investigation. This is the publication I mentioned before, which proposes primary DNA-based screening for Menke's disease. The figure shows an example of two patients and a control, uh, subject B, subject C, and normal. The control at the bottom shows histograms of number of copies sequenced for axons 5 through 15 of the ATP7A gene. Focusing on axons 10, 11, and 12, you can see where the little red marks are, there is evidence of deletion, and we see no copies in the histogram for subject C. And where the green marks are above, we can also see relative to the control an increase in the size of the histogram, suggesting a duplication. So next generation sequencing now is capable of addressing more than just single nucleotide variants. With manipulation of data, it can quite reliably identify copy number variants in the form of duplications and deletions. This is particularly important because each disorder is caused by a different gene, and each gene has its own properties in terms of what types of variants it tends to have, how many, where they are. And in the case of Menke's disease, about 30% of affected children have significant deletions, often de novo, and thus the assay must be robust in detecting that kind of a variant. So Dr. Diller has gone through for you the preliminary reasons for choosing the 11 genes listed here and the tumors they cause. We created a panel of these genes, the ones listed on the right, which are associated with the, these cancer predisposition syndromes and early onset cancer in children. We wanted to include genes that had the highest penetrance and the most common tumors, and this was the preliminary list that was developed. Shown here, without getting into details greatly, is an overview of the workflow, both for lab and bioinformatics, to go from a dried blood spot which our group has previously shown can easily supply adequate amounts of DNA for performing next generation sequencing. And the preparation, sequencing, variant calling, quality control, variant filtering, and uh, reporting involved in the process. When we first published this process <clears throat> in 2015, the turnaround time was about 120 hours. Timing is not so critical for cancer predisposition syndromes, so this is not an unreasonable time for completing the testing and reporting this disorder. The depth of sequencing was about 20 copies for over 90% of the targeted regions. When we ran preliminary studies with the PERC-seq panel, we started with known samples from Coriel that had well-defined variants and this concordance column on the right shows that when blinded samples were tested with the PERC-seq panel, there was a 100% accuracy. After identifying these known variants, we then went on to take some real patient samples and controls, and we uh, blinded the samples and again applied PERC-seq. It did pretty well. Uh, it identified the control, the one line where, um, where no variant was found. Um, and the, but there were a couple of differences in the reads, and there is some suggestion that there is optimization that can be performed on this panel before it is rolled out for clinical use. We are in the process of trying to perform these adjustments, hopefully through grant funding, and hope that this will provide improved diagnostic accuracy and potentially may shape the final gene list in the panel. We're also proposing to look at parental acceptance of this kind of a test. Our group also uh, was involved in the BabySeq trial, which offered whole exome sequencing as a newborn screen. And we did find that parents were a bit overwhelmed being approached with complete exome sequencing. 
In the case of PERC-seq, we are presenting to them a very defined reason for this genetic screening, looking for cancer predisposition syndromes. We are also planning to offer the choice of either just screening for retinoblastoma or RB1 <clears throat> sequencing, or doing the entire panel. And we propose to carefully survey parents as to why they would want to participate or not to participate to choose one or the other of these strategies so we can better understand what should be offered and how it should be offered. In summary, we believe based on the hypothesis presented by Dr. Diller and the modeling presented by Dr. Ye, that the data I presented to you above showing this is technically feasible to perform and that this is worth evaluating, evaluating further should be pursued. Targeted next generation sequencing can be performed with good accuracy. We do, do not need to start uh, it, right out in the public health sector. We should first uh, look at implementation in a research or a pilot setting. And we propose to evaluate both the panel acceptance to parents and the potential impact of surveillance protocols on identified newborns. Thank you.